First of all, I want to uh, welcome all of you to this uh, uh, Fujita uh, alumni webinar. Uh, today we have uh, two uh, great speakers, uh, Professor Kenan Arnautovic and Dr. Samir Kale. Uh, I, I want first of all to uh, thank Professor Yoko Kato, our uh, mentor, uh, for uh, always being here and supporting our initiatives. Uh, I want to uh, welcome also uh, Dr. Thomas Tommy. Uh, he will be my uh, co-moderator today as uh, uh, professor, professor Ishu Bisnoi uh, was called uh, to the OR for an emergency operation. Um, so uh, I have the pleasure and honor to introduce uh, our first speaker today, Professor Kenan Arnautovic. Uh, he uh, graduated from the School of Medicine uh, in Sarajevo, Bosnia-Herzegovina, as the top student uh, in his class and obtained a master degree in neurosurgery uh, and a PhD uh, graduation. He uh, did actually two uh, residency programs. Uh, the first one uh, in Sarajevo and the second uh, at the University of Arkansas uh, for Medical Sciences in Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, United States. Uh, he completed a skull base fellowship in Little Rock under the mentorship of Professor Osama Al Mefti. Uh, he is uh, double boarded in neurosurgery in Europe and uh, in the United States. Uh, he uh, serves as a professor of neurosurgery at the Department of Neurosurgery uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, and professor of neurology at the Department of Neurology at the University of Tennessee. Uh, professor Arnautovic has published uh, uh, extensively in neurosurgical uh, peer-reviewed journals uh, and has made three front cover articles for Journal of Neurosurgery. Uh, he described two original functional anatomical and neurosurgical entities, suboccipital cavernous sinus and suboccipital ligament. Uh, he is editor of uh, uh, several books and book chapters, and uh, he has a number of uh, uh, titles and serves as a chairman or a board member in a number of uh, committees. Uh, it will be very uh, long to, uh, to uh, tell all of them, but he is involved uh, in the American Association of Neurosurgical Surgeons uh, in the North American chapter of Southeast Europe Neurosurgical, Neurosurgical Society, in the World Federation of Neurosurgical Society. And he is a founder and past president of the Bosnian and Herzegovina American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he is uh, uh, associate editor uh, for operative uh, neurosurgery and uh, world neurosurgery. Uh, I uh, am really honored to uh, ask uh, Professor Arnautovic to talk about uh, uh, the topic he chose for today which is microsurgical treatment of intrinsic spinal cord tumors. So thank you, Professor Arnautovic, also for waking up so early. Uh, we know that uh, in Memphis, uh, it is uh, very early now. So thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, prof uh, first of all, good morning, everybody, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Can you see, Dr. Filetti, can you see my uh, screen? Yes, we can see it. All right, excellent. Okay, so uh, thank you again very much, Professor Yoko Kato, first of all, our mentor, our friend, a great supporter of neurosurgical education around the world. And uh, Professor Feletti, thank you very much for your kind invitation. And uh, dear colleagues, as you said, uh, it's really early here, it's five o'clock. So if I'm a little incoherent, <laughs> please forgive me. Uh, it's not my fault. So, um, I have a lot of things I love to do in neurosurgery, as you may know, and one of the things is because of my double training, you know, I, I really took my try, time to learn a little bit different things, but um, the spinal cord tumors are one of them, and I love to do them, and I do a lot of them, and I like to publish a lot about spinal cord tumors. So uh, I, I, I devoted this today's uh, presentation to lecture on the intrinsic spinal cord tumors. Those are um 
uh, very kind of interesting, tough, and uh, I'll I'll talk to them uh, about that uh, uh, through this presentation. Please interrupt me anytime, and if I'm running out of time, just stop me, and I, I'm not going to be offended at all. So, uh, as you mentioned, uh, just for disclosure, I don't have any any commercial disclosures. Um, I'm I am member of different uh, neurosurgical. Uh, uh, uh editorial boards and and functions and uh now to move on the topic you know primary spinal tumors are 15 percent roughly uh, uh out of all uh, cns tumors are spinal annual incidence is about two to ten in 100,000 cases and most of the patients are uh adult population now when we split extradural or intradural only about 45 goes to intradural and then extramedullary, intramedullary 5%. So I'm going to talk only about this 5% of the tumors that occur in the spine. <clears throat> and uh, they're really rare. And in, in, in average neurosurgical practice, neurosurgeons, uh, average neurosurgeon who's not devoted to treatment of those sees them rarely, maybe once every several years. When we look into the distribution, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> of different tumors in the spine, you know, about one third goes to schwannoma, which are most common in LS spine, then meningiomas, uh, one quarter, most common in thoracic, and then different gliomas, 22%. So only about one fifth of this 5% goes to gliomas. And then metastasis is also very rare. Um, um, uh, and then all miscellaneous uh, tumors that occasionally happen. So what are the clinical features? Usually it's either myelopathy and radiculopathy. Uh, symptoms last an average two years before the patient decides or somebody refers him for specialist evaluation. Pain can be local, nocturnal pain in the, in the, the overnight when the steroid level drops. Uh, there is frequently gait disturbance for a variety of reasons, weakness, spasticity, etc. And then bowel bladder incontinence or retention, constipation, etc. So uh, this is a breakdown of the spinal cord tumors about ten years ago. I think we have now double or triple that number. But um, we have published, as you mentioned, some of, the, of our experience before. I also about two three years ago published this book with a friend of mine, the Professor Gokaslan from Brown. And this is a review of our book in Neurosurgery Journal. So um, one of the main things that we need to know before or when we operate on these tumors is microsurgical anatomy. And um, I spend a lot of time in the lab. This is view of the thoracic spinal cord. You can see here how the ventral and dorsal nerve root come out from the spinal cord. You can see dentate ligament. And it's very, no, uh, very important to know all these intrinsic levels because by simple cutting of this dentate ligament, you can rotate spinal cord, uh, uh, you know, 30 degrees, maybe 20 degrees, depending on the tumor, and uh, relax the tension within it. We need to know microsurgical technique and, of course, understand the disease. One of the things that saved me and, more importantly, my patients, a lot of grief is this fat that I take at the beginning of surgery. Again, we published that as well. You know, I'm still waiting for my first spinal fluid leak or pseudomeningocele after removal of these tumors and simple removal of fat and placing it in epidural space to obliterate the dead space and enforce the suture line is very important. So some of the pearls from my operative technique, we use steroid bolus. We always used SSCP, MEP, D-Wave monitoring. Uh, we do use perioperative antibiotics for two doses. We do use Jackson table for thoracic and lumbar. That's the table that's translucent. And then uh, always expose the rostral caudal margins of the tumor with laminectomy or laminoplasty. If you need to do a fusion, we do a fusion. Neurosurgeons need to be very competent in fusion as we competent in microsurgery, pretty much in everything. And then divide dentate ligament with impunity as needed. Uh, as I said, intraoperative ultrasound is always present in my OR. So let's talk about spinal cord ependymomas. Uh, by the way, all of all the cases that I'm going to present today, all six, seven of them, eight, I don't know how many I have, are, are uh, uh, published in the literatures. And I made them 
um, uh, user uh, friendly, so so you can use them without any fee. So if you want to go know, know a little bit more, so this is a, a 48 years old man with dizziness, headaches, and inability to move his arms and legs. This was a pandemonium, obviously, in the spinal, uh, in the brainstem and uh, and uh, upper cervical spinal cord junction. Um, you can see here a cystic formation and solid formation combination, and we are going to go move on immediately to the surgical technique. Here you can see I'm opening the uh, left and right cerebellum medullary cistern. You can see vertebral artery down there in the death, and I'm moving on to the cent posterior central sulcus here and uh, through the median uh, septum approaching the tumor dorsally. One of the things you need to do is make sure you open widely, preserve the posterior columns, and expose the, the proximal as well as distal, distal margin of the tumor. You can see here there is already some uh, cystic fluid coming out, and here is my peri as a proximal aspect of the tumor. And uh, you can see here, this is basically the... The, the lesion. I'm going down, opening the rest of the arachnoid membrane, as you can see here. And uh, very important, uh, uh, wide open, so we can rotate and uh, manipulate uh, the tumor as needed. Now, here is the distal aspect of the tumor, again, micropatty there. And then we will start dissecting the tumor. Here you can see a nicely pseudocapsule. Uh, I use patties uh, to, to dissect over patties. I don't like to dissect directly uh, on the normal spinal cord. And here you can see I'm finding a plane between the tumor and the uh, posterior columns from inside. Uh, always stay on the side of the tumor. And here is the bulking for, for histology. Here is uh, progressing more and more. Uh, Always, I don't know about your histology people, but I, I told you people never happy, always want more and more at the very beginning. And um, here I'm, I'm now, you can see the tumor is becoming delivered uh, in, in, in one piece for the most part. And uh, here is, uh, again, gentle dissection. Always talk to your monitoring people. Always talk to them about, uh, here is the end of the dissection below. Uh, you can see uh, slowly, you, you see that I'm working with dissection towards the spinal cord, not away from it. And then um, eventually, um, you can also use the CUSA. One thing about CUSA, you need to be very careful. CUSA releases heat. So so you really need to keep it down on the lower settings. And then uh, uh, so to avoid any any injury. Uh, here is the final resection of the tumor. Last pieces here as we are approaching the end of surgery as the last, very last piece. And then um, eventually uh, a resection. This is a final uh, uh, view to the cavity. You can see intact columns, intact vasculature, gross total resection. And uh, happy patient he is very happy here you can see he came out for his stitches from inability to move his arms and legs his back to his work with uh, no particular uh, deficit completely recovered i've been monitoring him for a while now he is uh, uh, we didn't treat him with any further treatment this is a pandemoma grade two and uh we are uh, monitoring his whole neuroaxis every every year with MRIs now, two or three years after, out. Spinal cord hemangioblastoma again operated in uh, and published. This uh, lady is uh, von Hippel Lindau, came uh, 32 years old, inability of swallow with quadriparesis, uh, obviously hemangioblastoma. You can see a nodule just above the uh, vertebral artery. You can see nodule here and vertebral artery just above it. And in the interest of time, we'll proceed immediately with this lesion. Here is the expo exposure. You can see the nodule. Here is uh, releasing the arachnoid membrane to completely uh, release it and cutting of the 
cutting of the dentate ligament. On the right side, you can see here C2 nerve root. And again, I'm delineating here is cutting of the dentate of the dentate ligament. Uh, dentate ligament is a really important part of the structure uh, of the spinal cord, which you have to cut to relax the tension. So starting here, uh, note that this vein is always preserved till the very end, like with any other <coughs> anterior venous malformation. And then you need to get here to the uh, uh, plane between the spinal cord and uh, and uh, uh, nodule. Uh, there is a PL interface, and you see here I started slowly to dissect it and devascularize the tumor circumferentially. Here you can see one of the perforators. Uh, you see uh, uh, my my resident is holding the the uh, perforator. And I'm coming around and slowly dissecting it, preserving it, and uh, slowly going around. Here you see the perforator preserved, and again <clears throat> progressing with with, with, with dissection. <coughs> here I'm coming now to the other side. Again, you can see here C2 nerve roots. Here is the patty at the lower aspect of the tumor, and then. Uh, again, devascularization while, while leaving the final drainage vein completely intact at, till the very end. You can see here that uh, uh, it is completely a vascular surgery. There is no blood loss. There is no mm -hmm. blood interfering with your surgery. Here you can see the cavity coming into the depth. Again, stay on the side of the nodule, but right in that perfect plane between the uh, spinal cord and the nodule. And then uh, almost there, you see now I have almost 360 degrees resection of the nodule. And then final part is this uh, uh, vein that I'm coagulating now, finishing the end of surgery, at the end of surgery. <clears throat> You can see um, final coagulation and and resection of the lesion. This is the last view um, view of the operative field. The nodule is completely uh, resected, uh, de detached. And now, um, removal of the nodule and the cavity that remains afterwards uh, intact. Uh, in the recovery room <laughs> and tomorrow morning, patient immediately uh, felt fine and her swallowing completely returned right away. I mean, it didn't take days or weeks. She was able to have her breakfast. And you see here, the, the, the cyst has collapsed and um, there is no more nodule. Another case, a hemangioblastoma, 30-year-old uh, with urinary incontinence. It's at the level of T1. Now, note that there is a large cyst around the nodule here at T11, and then all the way up to the cranial cervical junction and brainstem, there is a syrinx, okay? So here is the opening of the dura. I like to protect my, and doing layers like Professor Yashagil taught me. You see here, I like to dissect layer by layer. I use Liga clips to um, secure my arachnoid membrane. And you see here, we are opening the arachnoid membrane and pretty much see a bunch of blood vessels, but it's completely unclear what's going on. So I'm, I'm first starting from below to try to understand the lesion. And here I'm opening the distal aspect of it. I can see a big, a big blood vessel down, uh, but I'm not gonna do anything. And note that I'm just starting uh, dissecting around that nodule. One of the things that you need always to remember, you don't want to go into these blood vessels and cause bleeding from inside. You need to identify this main bridging vein here in the center and preserve it till the very end. 
preserve the the um, <clears throat> nerves and go around the lesion. You see, I'm here going to through the glial glial uh, uh, interface and slowly, slowly progressing patients. You see this Yashagil bipolar, it has a nice uh, blunt uh, head. And you see how it serves me as a tool to, to dissect a very gentle atraumatic dissection. So again, <clears throat> starting to, you see, you can see more and more of a nodule now. Um, again, completely a vascular surgery. There is no blood whatsoever. And then here, uh, dissection progresses. And you see, if you stay outside of these blood vessels, if you if you uh, protect protect them, you will have a vascular uh, surgery till the very end, and uh, again stay outside of the PL uh, uh, surface of the nerve roots. Yet uh, uh, stay at the junction uh, of their their junction with the nodule and you'll be safe and patient will be safe. Because remember the thoracic spinal cord is one of the most sensitive because they have the, the uh, very poor vascularization compared to cervical and even lumbar because they're uh, <clears throat> vascularized by anterior posterior spinal arteries, but also to uh, very few um, and smaller uh, sizes, perforators coming from uh, radicular arteries until you come down to Adam Kievitz artery at uh, T11, T12 usually level. So thoracic spinal cord is particularly not forgiving um, for any vascular, vascular insults. So anyway, progressing with dissection again, I'll speed it up in the interest of time. <laughs> and here is the distal aspect. Sorry, it's, oh, I jumped too fast. This is already a uh, ventral tumor release. Taking out the last part of the coagulum of the blood clot. And you can see here now the draining vein remains till the very end. You can see here the whole nodule uh, dissected. And now you can see I'm rotating it out and removing it. You can see gross total resection and patient is intact neurologically and the syrinx completely collapsed. Moving on to spinal cord astrocytoma, we did a, a review, a published review of uh, low-grade astrocytomas. This is lady that came to my uh, attention with uh, difficulties with gait spasticity, you can see the tumor here in the upper thoracic spinal cord. And uh, <clears throat> and here is again opening of the dura and the midline, tuck up stitches. Uh, uh, you can see here I'm opening the arachnoid membrane right in the midline again. A uh, very gentle dissection of the dorsal roots to find the posterior septum. Uh, and then here, trying to find the vascular zone in the posterior midline, doing a myelotomy. And you can see here in a minute, we'll find the tumor. I'm still here at the PL. You can see that uh, PA is a little bit thickened here, so it's, it's, it's a little bit tougher to end. And then I like to uh, retract the PIA putting some proline stitches to open the spinal cord because remember a spinal cord is like a, a like a flat uh, panel like a plaque at the very beginning 
of development, embryological development. So I, I noticed that if you open the spinal cord like a book, in a way you see here, then uh, you can dissect freely and spinal cord tolerates the dissection much, much easier than when you work in, inside the cylinder. So the more you open it, and here I'm starting to di dissect the tumor from above, you can see here, I'm finding a plane looking again proximal and distal, taking some biopsy for my histology. <clears throat> and here, dissecting the tumor from uh, proximal to distal. Here you can see the bulk of the tumor nicely forming around, creating, uh, creating the plane. And you can see the, the difference in colors. You see whitish color of the normal spinal cord and purple grayish color of the tumor. The astrocytomas don't have a great plane, so you need to create it and be very careful with dissection. Here I'm, I'm going to the distal aspect of the tumor, and you can see right away here, you see the, the normal spinal cord and still the, the tumor. So piecemeal resection, creating a plane, and then uh, <clears throat> finishing up uh, the the resection. You can see here, tumor is gone on uh, imaging, and here you can see um, um, gross total resection. Here is my fat, which I use to prevent spinal fluid leak, and this is beauty. This is again before. You see how she was walking before, and this is again after tumor resection. They see how she improved significantly right at the time she came for suture removal. Another case, this is 61-year-old diabetic with worsening gait. Uh, she has been followed by serial MRIs over the past 10 years. You can see from 2006, 2011, 2015, you see how this tumor in the upper thoracic spinal cord increased. You see it was very small here, 2006, but over, over the course of nine years, it increased to the point that we had to operate. So similar situation as the last one. I'll go really fast through this one. This also has been published in my book, this uh, particular tumor. Here is the uh, opening. <clears throat> PL sutures, I told you about that. Opening of the uh, dorsal myelotomy. Uh, this is caudal exposure of the tumor. And by the way, for thoracic spine, the best... Uh, uh, intraoperative uh, navigation is AP x-rays that you um, uh, use. And I, I determine the levels very quickly, very easily with, with uh, C, uh, C arm x-rays. Here is the tumor now coming in the view. And you see the same thing, resecting the tumor right here at the junction where the normal, this is a normal uh, uh, spinal cord uh, posterior column. You see, and I'm taking the proximal aspect of the tumor detachment, creating a plate, and then slowly taking it out. These are the biopsies progressing with tumor resection. Here is uh, slowly cleaning the tumor. And by the way, this was low-grade astrocytoma. You see, I still see some, some tumor remnants and peeling it off normal. Uh, and then here is final uh, completion of the tumor resection. Last pieces. You see how the, the spinal cord is open like a book? So I think that's one of the reasons patients have so good results and so uh, nice, a nice radical resection. So here again, she was unable. This is uh, first walk after the uh, at the time of uh, suture removal, and this oh. one is uh, uh, <clears throat> this one is uh, uh, after that follow up. Uh, another uh, fifty eight years old, lower extremity weakness, T one T two astrocytoma. You can see the tumor here on the sagittal images right here. These tumors are not huge usually in size, but they they uh, are here is postoperative. You see the tumor is gone, 
patient doing well. He still uses his cane as he is preoperatively. Another case, uh, conus cauda uh, anaplastic astrocytoma, you can see it here, um, and then uh, resecting it uh, patient postoperatively. Final case, this is a spinal cord metastasis, 69-year-old with history of lung cancer. This was also published in operative neurosurgery. You can see the extension of the tumor at C5, mostly. Um, here is again opening, opening of arachnoid membrane. And you can see, you can tell the, the lesion is right here in the dorsal uh, left aspect of the patient. Left is proximal, right is distal, distal. And here again, like with any other spinal tumor, you see dorsal nerve is involved, so we'll go around it and uh, progressing with the resection of this metastasis. Again, staying on the, on the this is biopsy for our uh, pathologist. This dorsal nerve root is involved by the tumor as it is malignant metastasis, so we are dividing it. Uh, patient did not have any neurological deficit because these are sensory nerve roots that were involved. So no additional deficit. Here is your dentate ligament. Uh, the, I, I love this picture to show you how you open the dentate ligament and release the tension and, and the spinal cord dissection. Uh, the tumor of the spinal cord is much easier under much less tension. Here is coming around the tumor again. <clears throat> slowly dissecting and you see you can see the normal uh, structure of the spinal cord protecting with patties and coming just around the tumor uh, this is so small tumor you cannot use any kuza or anything in this particular case you just have to go slowly and dissect it around and the bulk it has needed from inside and he <clears throat> here it's becoming here you're delivering whole lesion out uh, without uh, any problems here? There is still some attachment to the right side. We'll work on that. And then once we resect this, this will be the end of the surgery. And we will look into the tumor cavity to make sure that it is a uh, gross total resection. So here the lesion comes out. There is still some little bit of tumor here in the lower aspect. And you see here, I'm slowly uh, uh, cleaning the blood. And here is the final result cavity and here is the fat how we put it we uh, put the fat with two seal here is our fat and you can see here tumor is gone final picture so in conclusions i can say that intrinsic spinal tumors can be generally radically resected it's not 100 percent of the times but in most cases uh, with no mortality and almost no morbidity Thorough preoperative planning and meticulous microsurgical techniques are essential for good outcomes. CSF leak and pseudomeningocele can be prevented with meticulous dural closure because if they happen and you need to reoperate and put a patient under lumbar drain, it will take precious a week or two from the patient recovery and rehab and uh, impede whole grade surgery. And then, as I said, patients tend to complete recover their neurological function after surgery. Uh, especially if it's not overly long, uh, neurological deficit preoperatively. And um, even with long standing and significant deficit, they tend to show improvement. And age is really not limit if you uh, do the surgery properly and if you uh, per carefully select um, even, even older patients do well. Well, thank you very much. I hope I didn't take much of your, of your time. I, I hope I stayed on on uh, time and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Professor Arnautovic. Uh, you have been perfectly on time and uh, your lecture was surely uh, very interesting and inspiring. Uh, we should now open the discussion. Uh, is there someone who has questions for Professor Arnautovic and his talk? Yeah, I see Dragan Jankovic. Uh, I, I'm not sure uh, if you hear me. Hear, you hear me? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we hear you, Dragon. We hear you. Hi, hi. Um, uh, good morning to all. I have one question. Uh, thank you very much for a great presentation, um, master master work. Uh, I have one question regarding to the, the preoperative embolization. Do you use preoperative uh, embolization, and uh, how long is interval between embolization and start of surgery? Is a good question. Um, the operative embolization in my hands for hemangioblastomas are not necessary. I showed you, I have a handful of cases and I, I don't use it. When I do use intraoperative embolization is uh, before surgery, of, for example, hemangiomas. Hemangiomas, uh, aggressive hemangiomas, which are very rare, about 5% of hemangiomas is, is, is uh, bloody and they go epidurally and they're extradural tumors, but cause significant neurological deficit from the uh, compression and also pressure. And as you know, you were in Memphis, you, you visited us, you are one of my former fellows. We have very good endovascular neurosurgery team. We have five neurosurgeons who are endovascular or six now, I think six who are endovascular neurosurgeons. So they perfectly embolize and I had a recent case where I embolized, it was L3 hemangioma. And, and that, that, at that time I used embolization. Now, when to do it is also a good question. You don't want to do it, um, if you can do it the same day and I tend to do it the same day, let them embolize in the morning and I schedule surgery around 11 o'clock, not very late, not to go in the, in the evening. But, um, because you don't want them to embolize your tumor. They do perfect job. They kill everything that can be killed as far as blood vessels are concerned. But uh, you don't want to do it the next day because due to the necrosis in the tumor, tumor can increase the volume. And then you'll have paraplegia of the patient in the middle of the night. And your partner who is on call will be very unhappy operating at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, so I, if I use it again, I use it rarely. It's specifically in hemangiomas. And if I use it, I use it usually the same day. Thank you. Thank you. I also have a quest couple of questions, actually. Uh, Professor Arnautovic, uh, you mentioned several times about uh, the use of uh, fat grafting uh, after closure. So my question is, uh, do you uh, always uh, uh, use a fat pad in all cases or just in those cases, in selected cases, uh, when uh, you are afraid uh, for uh, uh, CSF leakage? Uh, this is my first question. Yes, please. Okay, so let's answer first one and then we'll go. So yes, I use it always. I use for all posterior fossa tumors. I use for all spinal cord tumors. And uh, if patient is very, uh, very, uh, you know, overweight, you, you have also fat and subcutaneous tissues, but many of patients are young and you have to go to paraumbilical area. But you have it, I always at the beginning of surgery harvest, put it in antibiotics. The reason I'm using, as I said, I am still waiting for my first CSF leak or pseudomeningocele. It's more a simple procedure. When you open the, dura open and release spinal fluid and then close at the end you never have even when you use valsalva maneuver at the closure you never have that original pressure within the spinal uh, intradural compartment and you never are 100 percent sure that you did watertight closure you close it you do valsalva maneuver with your anesthesiologist but still there is always a risk of leak especially when a patient gets up when the pressure increases so by, by, by putting this uh, fat into the space where the bone was previously, you obliterate the dead space and, and prevent uh, formation of pseudomeningocele and eventually leakage outside. Um, uh, so I use it always. I am happy that, I'm, again, I'm still waiting for my first CSF leak. And by the way, not only in this, in, in, in posterior fossa tumors as well, you know, and um, I think it's a great uh, uh, addition to your surgery. Prevent complications is one of the, our tasks. It makes recovery so fast. And I'm also 
so happy with this fat. I learned that it's Calvary surgery and I applied it here. So, yes. Thank you. Uh, my Well, before my second question, we have a question from the chat. Uh, I, I read it. How uh, do you do dissection from below upwards or vice versa? As I showed, I do proximal distal exposure and then go around the tumor. And it all depends on the pathology intraoperative situation. So you're not, it's not one size fits all. Uh, but... Um, um, I usually like to go along the nerve. So spinal cord is a cylinder, right? You saw we open the book as much lateral as possible. And then from proximal to distal, follow the longitudinally, the natural path of the fibers and, and everything else. Because if you go towards the fibers and not along the fibers, the chances of swelling and functional impairment is greater. So so that's that's how we do it. Thank you. And my yeah, so second Can I ask something yeah. about dura closer? Uh, yeah, 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 Ricardo. Uh, yeah, Ricardo. So your Go second on. question is different. It's different. Go ahead with oh, your question. Okay. okay, okay. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And thanks for uh, Professor Arnautovic for the nice presentation. I just want to ask if uh, he has got some experience with the uh, fascial ATA. For the fat, for using the fat instead of the abdominal fat, or to close the dura when you have a dural defect, maybe with a posterior meningioma or something similar. So, am I familiar with fascia lata? You bet I am familiar. I grew up in Little Rock neurosurgically. I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas with Dr. Almefti. And at 11 in the evening, I would be going. Uh, as a resident at that time, later I was fellow, but as a resident at that time, I would go and dig below the, <laughs> and harvest fascia lata probably a million times, you know. So I know very well fascia lata. No, I don't use fascia lata, to be honest with you. I use, there is a special, and I'm not uh, advertising anything here, but you asked me the question, so I have the answer. Medtronic produces a special bovine pericardium that is uh, uh, delivered in different sizes. So if you have a defect in the dura and uh, you just uh, tell your circulator to open certain size, it soaks in, in water, you cut it to fit a lot of space and you meticulously close it. So, so I use that for the graph, both for my Chiaris. And as you know, I have a larger series of adult Chiaris in the world. And again, <clears throat> using in Chiaris, um, uh, people report uh, frightening uh, number of uh, CSF leaks with fat. I am still wait waiting for my first CSF leak or pseudo meningocele with Chiaris. I hope one of the residents and fellows like Dragan Jankovic will come and uh, and write up that paper finally about Chiari malformation and, and prevention of CSF leak, but it's another topic. So yes, I know fascia lata very much. Yes, uh, uh, I used it in the past. I think the novel technologists are now uh, not needing fascia lata necessarily. It's always great to have aut autologous graft and we know where to harvest it, but I'm using it less and less. I don't know whether I used it in the past 20 years, a few times only. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. We have another question from uh, the chat. Uh, have you, uh, well, I, I, I think you have experienced uh, uh, using glue, fibrin glue uh, or uh, other devices. Uh, I, I would add also like tacosil. Sometimes I use tacosil, uh, which uh, attach uh, very well. It's not a dura substitutor, but a substitute, <laughs> substitute, but uh, it's, uh, it's uh, very effective. So what's your opinion about this uh, so product? So, yes, I use uh, always uh, fibrin glue. In addition, when I put fat, I do, I showed you at the end of the case, I use the fibrin glue around it to kind of seal it. And I use it very regularly. It's it's a good product. It's a cheap product. And it's it's efficient, efficient product. Uh, um, it's like cooking, you know. Uh, I use it for my pituitaries. I use only... Um, uh, fat. I don't use any nasoceptal nasoceptal flaps. I use only fat tissue. Again, 
and people who visited me, there are a lot of neurosurgeons around the world who visited us and were our fellows, you know, I use it at the end of pituitary surgery as well, and still waiting for first CSF leak through the nose. So my current rate is 0%, believe it or not, and uh, fat is unbelievable, uh, autographed, beats anything that I know. Thank you, uh, Samir. Kale, raise the yes, hand. Sir. Uh, uh, good morning, Professor Kenan. Uh, I wanted to know uh, whether you uh, reapproximate the pia and the arachnoid uh, uh, during the closure, and then you close the dura and then you place the fat. Or uh, how how uh, do you find that useful? I don't close the pia. I know my friend George Jalo, who is a big pediatric uh, uh, spinal cord tumor and good friend of mine from John Hopkins. Uh, I asked him one time, should we close? And he said it's up to a neurosurgical preference. I know some neurosurgeons do. I don't. I like to have it. You know, I'm, I'm always worried about syrinx forming in the spinal canal. Um, so I don't, as, as I showed you, I don't think it's wrong. I just don't. And I got away after several hundred cases without it. But um, I, I think there is nothing wrong with that. Arachnoid membrane. If I have a good, uh, I close it. I first try with coagulation to close it and approximate the edges of paranoid and then close the dura with the running stitch. Or if I have really a uh, great microsurgical uh, uh, technique resident with me, uh, chief resident, they take 780 proline and close it uh, and then um, close the dura as, as above. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would like to move the discussion from the closure to the uh, actual uh, resection of tumors uh, with my uh, question. Uh, and my question comes from a recent experience. Uh, uh, we had a patient uh, with a, a spinal cord tumor. Uh, he had a, a severe deficit and we operated him uh, and we did, of course, using intraoperative uh, uh, neuromonitoring. So in this patient, uh, immediately, uh, we, we didn't have a good B-wave response, uh, first of all. And uh, while we were at the beginning of the operation, uh, so uh, opening uh, the, the median sulcus, uh, the evoked potentials dropped. Of course, uh, uh, we did what we usually do. Uh, we wait, uh, we, we irrigated with saline. Uh, initially, uh, they recovered a little bit, but very soon they disappeared. So my question is, I'm, I'm sure you have some experience uh, about such cases. So very unlucky cases uh, when uh, the potentials drop at the very beginning of the operation. So my question is, uh, how do you deal with these selected cases? Uh, do you keep uh, with resection, uh, go on with resection? Do you uh, quit surgery? Because some um, colleagues uh, claim it's better to uh, quit, maybe just open the central sulcus and then close everything and wait for the tumor to come out uh, in a natural way and reoperate uh, after some weeks. Uh, I mean, there are many different uh, um, habits uh, around the neurosurgical community. So I would like to know your opinion in this very selected group of patients. So first of all, and this is for younger younger colleagues. Uh, first of all, you need to have a good rapport to the patient and explain to him or her every detail. And I have sign consent i really take my time talk to them about all the possibilities second you have to have a good uh, monitoring people who really you trust who are experienced who are not beginners who know what they're doing third you as a neurosurgeon with experience is like a pilot facing a problem in the flight okay and uh you you, you should i have some friends pilots close friends so they tell me sometimes things but um, you you know what happened. For example, you are opening the dura and the the, the uh, wave di disappear. Did you do anything? You watch with your anesthesia carefully. Also, the blood pressure. 
you give them instruction before surgery to maintain that's very important your blood pressure needs to be at least above 75 but preferably in 80s and 90s mean arterial blood pressure so you have to maintain that and then you know when you dissect what are you doing are you did you coagulate a big blood vessel that goes into the spinal cord just three minutes ago did you did your resident nick into the spinal cord and there it was did you dissect too deep and you were a little bit rough so you know that something wrong happened or didn't happen so you calculate that i also give a bolus of steroids but i tend not to stop surgery you know you wait a little bit you are there to eliminate the problem as long as surgery is going well as long as you are progressing well as long as you are not aware that you did anything wrong in terms of some major blunder that you that you had some some problem that your technique caused some problem uh i i would not stop uh because that patient is asking for treatment you're giving him treatment the monitoring is only a tool it's not it's not uh so uh, but but above everything dr Felitti, i use judgment you know i i you know you as a neurosurgeon are you going to return your plane back and land back where you were or you're going to continue and fly you know it's it's ultimately your decision but i thankfully didn't have many of those experiences i had some uh but it's interoperative judgment but so far on this view i did not stop i waited they improved sometimes they didn't but i completed the surgery uh because you know there was a big tumor in the spinal cord huge meningioma compressing i remember one time i mean what do you do are you gonna leave the huge meningioma with the problem and sometimes, you know, they find out at the end of surgery, oh, my electrodes was disconnected. I didn't see it. Your tech can, your, your neurologist can say, oh, there was a, so because of that technical error that they could not recognize because everything is, is covered with the sterile, uh, you should stop surgery. So I don't know whether I answered your question, but that's how, you, how I do it, you know. Yes, I, I agree. We also didn't stop in this case. We we didn't have uh, major, uh, you know, uh, pro technical problems during operation, or uh, we didn't have uh, uh, like disconnections of electrodes. So they, the the potentials were quite reliable. But we also made the same decision uh, uh, you are saying. But you know, after the operation, when you see the patient, uh, which uh, uh, worsened a lot. Uh, you always wonder whether you did a, a good decision, you took the good decision, the best decision for him or not. Of course, uh, we, we never know. We don't have uh, right uh, uh, the, the, the demonstration if uh, what happened if we did uh, something different. But it's good to, to share experiences about these difficult cases. So, yeah, are there other questions for Professor Arnautovic? I have a question uh, and comment, please. Uh, yes, thank I you, guess. Professor Arnautovic, for a wonderful lecture, as always. And uh, I'm sending my regards. I had that great opportunity to be international resident fellow, Professor Arnautovic, who is really open for especially young neurosurgeons, residents, etc. And that door uh, opened many, many other doors in USA, in Japan, etc. Uh, regarding the perioperative management uh, with the corticosteroids and postoperative management, uh, how much we should administer for the patients uh, and in the postoperative period too? And the second question is just uh, your experience for uh, uh, brain glioma and the difference between dissection technique in brain glioma uh, and spinal uh, glioma. I mean, uh, it's more sensitive tissue, we can say, in spinal cord. So just uh, your opinion on the dissection technique. Thank you. So thank you, Adi. Good to see you. Um, so the technique, uh, steroids, first question. I use steroids. I like to use, if you use, use a big bolus. I use bolus of 10 milligrams at the beginning. And then, and then during surgery, bolus them again as needed based on the uh, waveforms and length of surgery, et cetera. And then after surgery, I use them for various time, but I immediately after surgery, after a few days, start tapering. You don't want to keep them with steroids very long. If the steroids are working, they will work uh, 
uh, or not, but you don't want to keep them, you know, two weeks on 10 milligrams every four hours. It's, in my opinion, it's crazy because it can cause a lot of different problems, including the wound healing, the problems, including the uh, problems with immune, uh, you know, immune response and uh, fighting infections, which is always a possibility and all that. So I quickly uh, taper off after surgery or slowly over the week, but not more than a week. I, I can't remember holding them on steroids more than a week. Um, the second question was the uh, difference between gliomas in the brain and uh, and the spinal cord. It's completely different surgery because in, in the brain, as you know, uh, much bigger size, brain is different organ. Uh, some rules apply, obviously monitoring is, is used on both. Um, uh, in the brain, it's 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 uh, the section is on the wider uh, area. Uh, sometimes you do inner decompression and go around in the brain. Sometimes you go around all the way. Depends on the type of tumor, etc. In the spinal cord, it's a little bit different because, as you saw, it's a cylinder. It is different and uh, very important to open the spinal cord as a book, as I mentioned. The more you open it will give you more exposure and tumor will be easier easier delivered so uh, i think it's it's a different different technique for spinal cord gliomas and uh, and brain brain gliomas obviously thank you thank you any other question or comment professor yoko kato if you, you want to say something to uh, close this uh, discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cannon. Uh, what a nice uh, presentation. And uh, that you showed us so many, the beautiful the, the demonstrative video, and also the many comments. It's, it was very clear. And uh, uh, spinal cord is not familiar with all the neuroscience, I think, especially the young doctors. So I, I think uh, maybe in the future, please uh, tell us more, please. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful talk. Thank you, Professor Kato. Thank Always you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Arnautovic, again for uh, this great lecture. And we uh, shall move on now with the second uh, uh, speaker. And I would like to ask uh, my co uh, moderator, uh, Dr. Thomas Tommy, to introduce our second speaker. Yeah, uh, good day, uh, colleagues from uh, parts of the world and Professor Anatovich, Professor Yoko Kato. I'm sorry for the display picture because I'm on my car. Um, I would like to uh, co-host this session and I would like to call Dr. Samir Kale from Mumbai, India, that will have a topic about neurovascular intervention. Uh, please, Dr. Kale, the time is yours. Thank you, thank you. Uh, good evening, Professor Kato Sensei, and uh, good evening to all of the panelists. So, good evening, everyone, and uh, uh, let's start with the uh, topic. So, my topic is uh, neuro intervention, uh, endovascular neurosurgery, a primer for young neurosurgeons and neurosurgical residents. Uh, currently, I am a fellow in Fujita Health University, Bantani Hospital, under Professor Yoko Kato Sensei. Uh, so uh, let's start with the history of neuro intervention. Uh, this is a photo of Professor Egeras Moniaz. He was the uh, first person who uh, described the cerebral angiography. He was a neurologist and uh, uh, he studied at the University of Coimbra uh, and there uh, he found his name that uh, Egeras Moniaz. Uh, he also had a political career. He, he was a minister of foreign affairs. Uh, at the age of 51, he returned back and he started indulging in his uh, medical interest. He also received a Nobel Prize for prefrontal leukotomy in psychotic patients. Uh, uh, after the discovery of X-rays, an angiographic study of an amputated arm was conducted, which was successful uh, using a Tichman mixture of lime, uh, mercury, sulfide, and petroleum. So uh, as the work in peripheral angiography was going on, Munias and uh, Almedia Diaz and Almedia Lima, his co-workers, they started performing animal and human experiments uh, and uh, they, uh, grieve, which grieve the early uh, techniques of cerebral angiography. So Monia's uh, described curvatures of the carotid siphon and sylvan region uh, vessels. Uh, they obtained images using oral bromide and lithium salts. 
uh, what he did was he did a direct intracarotid injection in uh, and performed the first successful angiogram in dogs using 100% of strontium bromide. Uh, in 1927, he attempted 70% of transient uh, bromide in patients, and uh, but was not to the satisfaction. Finally, in the eighth patient, uh, he was successful using 25% uh, 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 of the sodium iodide. Uh, in a paper by Duarte and Golo uh, in interventional neuroradiology, uh, the pioneer Egbias Monia is the pioneer of angi cerebral angiography. Uh, these are some of the pictures depicted of his cerebral angiography in 1927. This was the first successful arteriography of a living patient in 28, uh, uh, done on 28th of June 1927. You can see the venous face of the glioblastoma. Uh, here you can see the internal carotid artery thrombosis and a cerebral aneurysm of the supraconoid segment. Uh, you can see a, a frontal tumor displacing the anterior cerebral artery. Similarly, an arteriovenous angioma. Uh, so, how did the concept of embolization start? So, it was started by Werner and uh, what he used to do was he used to do a craniotomy and he used to puncture the wall of the aneurysm. And um, after puncturing it, he used to put 9M of silver enamel wire inside it. And after taking a radiograph, the aneurysm was completely uh, obliterated. So, this started the concept of embolization of the uh, uh, aneurysm. So, sorry, uh, just a minute. So the Seldinger technique, uh, it was one of the major landmark for all the um, uh, 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 angiographic procedures. And uh, with the introduction of Seldinger technique, uh, it was easy to catheterize both the carotid and the vertebral arteries from a single puncture of the femoral artery. The endovascular approach. In 1970, uh, with the detachable and non-detachable balloons, Serbonico started uh, a series of 300 patients and he started the endovascular treatment. Uh, the problem with this uh, was the balloon being a rigid and with the pulsations of the balloon, the angioplasty of the aneurysm wall used to occur and there used to be a delayed or an uh, immediate aneurysm rupture. So uh, it was a small uh, clinical series of inoperable aneurysm. Uh, the most important turning point uh, came with the uh, detachable, detachable coils. So this is a picture of Sir Guglio Guglielmi. Uh, he noticed uh, he was a surgeon and a radiologist while working in a radio uh, shop of his brother, he noticed that when a current is passed through a wire, it used to give up, it used to break because of the uh, resistance offered by the wire and the heat generated. And this formed the concept of the detachable coils. The target therapeutics was the first to develop the detachable coil. And this is the first photograph. You can see this is a pusher wire and this is a uh, uh, coil. Uh, this was the first photograph published in uh, 1989, and uh, this was this depicted the electrolytic detachment of the coil and uh, endovascular, endovascular embolization of the aneurysm. So this was the uh, uh, first ever detachable coil made by Target Therapeutics USA. Uh, the digital subtraction angiography. So what is a digital subtraction angiography, which is a workhorse of a neuro intervention uh, 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 procedures? So it's a fluoroscopic technique and it is used to clearly visualize the blood vessels. So how uh, it works is it uh, produces uh, images using contrast medium by subtracting a pre-contrast image and uh, from the subsequent image after uh, the contrast has been uh, uh, pushed. So the term is it's called as a digital subtraction angiography. You can see this is a lateral view of a uh, DSA of the uh, ICPA and uh, you can see how clearly all the vessels being it smaller or the uh, medium-sized vessels, all ACA, MCA, and almost all the branches and the perforators are even being seen. This is an uh, AP view, and you can see the A1, A2, and right till uh, M1 to M4. So this is a town's view uh, of a right vertebral artery injection. You can see how nicely all the vasculature without any uh, uh, obscuration by the uh, skull or the bony uh, structure uh, is visualized. Uh, so, uh, where do you do a DSA? We can do it uh, in a biplane cath lab so the, uh, um, uh, uh, and a monoplane cath lab. So, biplane cath lab gives you two uh, consecutive views, uh, uh, an AP and a uh, lateral view. And uh, these are some of the uh, uh, DSAs uh, of my patients. So, this is a exact how it uh, 
uh, you uh, get a picture and this is a BSC of 33 years old uh, with an MC aneurysm. Uh, the previous surgeon had tried to clip the aneurysm but ended up with wrapping it. Uh, so now performing a cerebral angiogram, you need an arterial access. The most, uh, 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 you need a diagnostic catheter, you need a guide wire, contrast, uh, lock syringe, injectors, views. I feel that uh, once you're going for a DSA, you should do um, uh, DSA of all the major cranial vessels and if required, do a selective and a super selective angiogram. So this is a uh, distal radial artery approach. Uh, this is a transradial route. You take a short sheath and you uh, uh, puncture the uh, radial artery. So uh, if not, you can go through a transfemoral route. The problem with transfemoral route is patient needs to lie down after uh, the DSA for a period of around uh, four to five hours, still with the, uh, no movement so that there is no formation of the uh, hematoma adventure site. So these are the catheters. Uh, uh, most uh, common uh, catheter used for transradial route is the SIM2. And uh, from transfemoral, you can either use an H headhunter, which is also called as H1 or a JB2. Uh, this is how you uh, cook the vessels. Uh, this is the arch of aorta through which uh, the diagnostic catheter is uh, uh, navigated uh, over a wire, guide wire. It's an O35 wire and you hook the uh, 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 subclavian uh, 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 brachiocephalic artery and uh, uh, you uh, uh, let the uh, guide wire uh, ahead and guide the uh, catheter. So this is a leolog syringe. This is very important uh, so as to prevent any kind of air embolism. So these are some standard views through which you can uh, visualize whole of the ICA, the town's view, water's view uh, for the cavernous uh, ICA, the PA view and the lateral view. This is a power injector where you can uh, uh, set the number of uh, uh, contrast that you need to uh, be uh, pushed in during a uh, DSA. So these are some of the indications. Most common uh, uh, is uh, non-traumatic SH with uh, uh, acute stroke being the second, non-traumatic IVA, ICH, uh, to study the cross flow the, uh, of the aneurysm, the complex anatomy of the aneurysm, to see whether there is cerebral vasospasm, preoperative tumor embolization, and uh, most important uh, uh, for ABM and dual AV fistulas planning, and uh, again, uh, studying the arterio uh, angio architecture of those vessels. In extracranial, you can uh, do it for carotid stenosis, carotid blowout, preoperative tumor embolization for JNA. As such, there are no contraindications, but relative contraindications are contrast allergy for which uh, you can uh, pre-operate, uh, pre-DSA, uh, you can give methylprednisolone, uh, use a low molecular uh, uh, or smaller contrast and uh, um, uh, hydrate the patient uh, uh, quite good. So coming to the therapeutic neurointervention. So the basic idea of understanding the devices, because for the problem with uh, when I was learning was that I uh, had difficulty in understanding the devices. So the further talk is based on understanding of the devices. Uh, so the catheters, wires, balloon stands, all of which we'll see in coming uh, part. So the catheters, uh, these are different types of catheters. These are guiding catheters, guiding sheet, intermediate catheters, aspiration catheters, and micro catheters. So the most important aspect of knowing a catheter is to know the outer diameter and the internal diameter. The difference between a guiding catheter and a guiding sheath is the guiding sheath are uh, 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 known by their outer diameters, while the guiding catheter is known by their, its internal diameter. The most important uh, uh, thing to remember is the three French is equal to one millimeter or 0 0.039 inches. Uh, the micro catheters are less than three French. Uh, they can be shaped and pre-shaped. There are good micro catheters which are uh, called as flow directed uh, and these flow directed are specially uh, uh, used to assess small complex vessels of AVM and dural AV fistulas. We can, uh, we also have uh, pre-shaped micro catheters and shaping of the micro catheter as per the need of the ves uh, vessel and the uh, aneurysm or any other uh, uh, AVM uh, which vessel which you need to hook can be done. Uh, it is done at a degree of 120 degrees Celsius for 90 seconds and there are multiple transition zones. Uh, the most important concept of pushability and trackability. So uh, a catheter is made pushable. That means it can withhold the back push or the resistance from the uh, micro catheter and the distal access catheter. 
uh, only if it's made of some good stainless steel and the braiding. The braiding has to be a crisscross. Uh, trackability is the capability of a catheter to negotiate tortuous uh, vessels over a uh, 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 guide wire. So there are multiple companies, Medtronics, Kaneka, Tokai, Striker, and many more. So whichever is available in your country, you can um, do with that thing. So this is what I was talking about, the internal diameter. This is a uh, 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 Neuromax 461. You see, this is a six French Neuromax. This is a long sheet. But uh, uh, its internal diameter is still around 0 0.088 inch. So you can easily take two devices, one for balloon or a stand, and another for uh, carrying out the coiling. And you can park this uh, almost in the uh, distal ICA, uh, just below the Petrus uh, 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 compart Petrus uh, ICA. So this is what the braiding. Uh, this makes the catheter more pushable and. Uh, most uh, importantly now, almost all the uh, 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 companies have started using nitinol and along with nitinol, they use steel and uh, combination and hybrid uh, micro um, catheters are being prepared. So uh, you see the difference between uh, this is a guiding catheter. So it needs to be more pushable, the crisscross view along with uh, uh, compared to this aspiration catheter, which needs to go uh, at least um, it needs to cross the M1. So uh, you see how uh, a helical loop has been created. So it becomes more trackable. Uh, the most, uh, another important thing is that it is lined uh, by a PTFE liner, which makes it more smoother for delivery of other uh, devices through it. So this is a Maxman micro catheter. And uh, so uh, there is a, something called as balloon anchoring technique for balloon guided catheters. And you can see, you can inflate the balloon hold the um, uh, guiding catheter over there and then trans, uh, um, uh, negotiate all the other catheters, micro catheters and intermediate catheters to it. Uh, balloon occlusion also helps in prevention of distal embolization in the process of mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, coming to wires, for diagnostic purpose, uh, diagnostic procedures, hydrophilic wires are used, uh, which are uh, 0.035 inch and angled J wire. Uh, some stiff wires uh, 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 stiff guide wires are also used and those can be used particularly for tortuous anatomy but we cannot cross beyond the uh, cavernous segment. Micro wires have diameter ranging from 0.7 to uh, 0.21 0 to 1 inches and the length about is 200 centimeters. Uh, shaping of the wire uh, I feel is one of the very important uh, uh, concept in negotiating the vessels and uh, many companies similar to micro catheters are there. These are radio, fo radio focused by Teremo and uh, this is a O3 wire, it's a diagnostic wire. So the uh, make of the wire is it has an inner mandrel which is made up of tight, um, uh, which is made up of either uh, um, nitinol or sometimes stainless steel and over that they form another uh, uh, material which is radio opaque, generally titanium or platinum and uh, over uh, which they put an hydrophilic polymer coating. So the most important uh, uh, aspects of a micro wire as whether it's a toggable wire, toggability is once you rotate it through a 90 degree, it, the uh, proximal tip and uh, the distal tip should rotate by 90 degree or you rotate it by 180 degree, it should rotate by 180 degree. The, it should be trackable. It should be soft in shape to uh, take the torches anatomy. It should be flexibility. There should be no kinking and there should be a shape retention. So this is a talker through which you uh, talk the uh, micro wire and um, cannulate the vessels. So uh, coming to the balloons in uh, um, neuro intervention. So the balloon catheters are generally single lumen or double lumen. They load over a 0 0.10 or uh, 0.014 inch wire. They are hyper compliant, uh, compliant and semi compliant. You can see uh, a um, micro, uh, um, you can see a balloon catheter by septa which is uh, prepared by Teremo. There is another uh, 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 tube which connects to the um, balloon for uh, inflation and deflation. And while you can carry on uh, your micro, uh, your endovascular procedure through the uh, main uh, tube, and uh, you can do a um, uh, push and plug technique uh, with the use of uh, this, uh, you block the uh, primary vasculature of the AVM. And you can uh, push the onyx uh, through this. That's the importance of this balloon during a uh, AVM embolization. So uh, during a uh, basilar artery aneurysm embolization or 
during uh, uh, any uh, difficult vessel uh, uh, hooking you can utilize a hyper com super compliant balloon uh, such as transform and you can see how it has taken the shape of the uh, uh, and uh, occluded both the pcs and uh, easily you can go and uh, foil the aneurysm so the sizes of the balloon uh, they range from 3 to 7 mm and the length is around 10 to 30 mm uh, these are used for neck remodeling and uh, can be used for uh, vasospasm and uh, occlude the parent artery if there is an uh, aneurysmal rupture so the balloons for uh, intracranial atherosclerotic diseases are uh, this is a gateway over the wire and a sterling monorail the normal minimal pressure which uh, uh, they uh, advises at 6 atmosphere and this helps uh, in good opening of the intracranial uh, atherosclerotic disease. The stents in intracranial uh, uh, stents used uh, in intracranial neuro intervention are uh, uh, stents are of two types: open cell and closed cell uh, types. Open cell stents have connecting and non-connecting struts, while closed stents have fully connecting struts. They are made up of nitinol and platinum, and uh, they can be positioned into the parent artery without a microcatheter. Most commonly, they are used for stent-assisted coiling. So this is what is an open cell. There is no continuously connection between the struts. This makes it more amenable, more uh, bendable uh, than the closed stent. And uh, the closed stent, uh, they have uh, uh, all the connecting struts towards one another. So this is an enterprise uh, closed cell design. And this is a neuroform uh, open, uh, semi-open cell design. So these are some of the techniques. This is called as gelling of the microcatheter. You first uh, uh, hook in the aneurysm and you uh, place your microcatheter over there. Then you uh, open up the, then you deploy the stent and then you proceed with the coiling. Uh, finally, removing the uh, microcatheter. Uh, this is a, um, if uh, during the um, procedure of coiling and your microcatheter comes out, then there is a trans cell technique through which you can um, go inside the aneurysm again and do a uh, the, uh, and finish your coiling. This is a T stent coiling where you uh, place two uh, stents. And this is a basal top aneurysm. Uh, this is a semi gelling technique wherein the advantage is that the microcatheter can be freely moved because once the uh, microcatheter is jailed, the and uh, the uh, fillings occurs, you don't get to see the tip of the microcatheter. In this uh, uh, semi-gelling technique, you, uh, it becomes uh, easily uh, to uh, uh, manipulate the tip of the microcatheter. So this is a wingspan stent used uh, uh, for uh, intracranial uh, atherosclerotic disease. And uh, this is how you uh, deploy a wingspan stent. Uh, you measure it uh, and you do a PTA, uh, particular transcendental aluminum uh, angioplasty. And uh, following which you uh, uh, deploy a uh, wingspan stent. The embolic agents, uh, these are very, very important and uh, most commonly used for AVMs and dural fistulas and CCFs. Uh, onyx uh, and NBCA are the most commonly used. Uh, onyx is an ethanol vinyl alcohol copolymer, and NBCA is an N butyl uh, two cyanide acrylate. The mechanism is that when they come in contact, it precipitates, uh, it precipitates and it forms a copolymer. Uh, it's similar to a lava solidifying, but uh, the solidification occurs from outer to inner part. And in NBCA, uh, it forms a polymer uh, with uh, reaction uh, with the hydroxy ion. NBCA is an adhesive and it forms a hard cast. So the problem is that during uh, uh, removal of the microcatheter, it might uh, stuck into the um, cast. Uh, the thrombogenicity is uh, higher compared to onyx. Uh, onyx being a non-adhesive, it forms a soft and spongy uh, cast and is less thrombogenic. Uh, there are specific delivery microcatheters for NBC. Uh, uh, there are uh, specific delivery catheters for uh, onyx. Uh, this is how an NBCA looks. It uh, comes in pre-filled uh, 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 syringes. And uh, this is a cast of an onyx. It comes in two forms, onyx. 18 and onyx 34, uh, 36. Uh, this is more uh, uh, viscous and uh, when it's mixed with DMSO, uh, it causes uh, the uh, um, uh, 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 cast to uh, penetrate more distally or it uh, helps the onyx to penetrate more distally. Uh, this is uh, another uh, fill uh, produced by uh, uh, Micromension. It's uh, similar to uh, the 
uh, Onyx uh, one, but the only uh, advantage is that uh, it comes in a pre-filled. Onyx you have to prepare before you uh, start the embolization procedure. Uh, so this is a micro catheter, uh, which I was talking about. There are detachable tips. And once you are inside the uh, AVM or you are inside the uh, feeder, you can detach the micro catheter. Once you form, uh, see the reflux and you can detach it and leave the uh, tip of the micro catheter over there. Uh, this is a pressure cooker technique by Dr. Rene Shefo. Uh, when there you are inside the arterial feeder, you can uh, put a coil or use a balloon and you can uh, create a plug through which the reflux and uh, the risk of the um, uh, embolic, uh, embolics coming into the parent artery is less and thus uh, uh, distal penetration becomes more. Uh, coming to the coils, flow diverters and web device. Uh, coils are made up of platinum thread and that is loop around a platinum core. Thus making it, uh, uh, and which is connected to a pusher wire, thus making it uh, uh, um, uh, see, uh, seeing on the uh, uh, angiography. There are different mechanisms of detachment, electrolytic or mechanical. Uh, they are traditionally sized into 10 and 18 systems uh, and uh, the actual diameter is around 0.08 to 0.016 inches. Uh, the shapes are different uh, coming, uh, uh, it's like a framing coil. These are 3D coils used for framing the dome and it, they form a scaffolding inside the aneurysm. So once the scaffolding is there, you can start with packing the aneurysm with the uh, helical coils, which are called as finish, uh, uh, filling coils and finishing coils should, these are more softer and they uh, go into the interstices of the uh, aneurysm. So this is a uh, uh, coil which is used to frame an aneurysm. This you fill and this is you uh, finish the aneurysm. Now, uh, this is a 3D framing coil. And here you can see the uh, size of the uh, 3D framing coil is around 15 into 40, 40 centimeters being the length. And there are two uh, uh, numbers over here, 15 millimeter and 11.25. So the primary loop, which it will make is, will be of a 15 millimeter and the secondary loop will be of 11.25 millimeter and which will help in uh, framing the uh, uh, dome of the aneurysm. And uh, these are hydro coils, this expand post deployment. So this is a, how you frame a coil. Uh, sorry, this is how you frame an aneurysm. Higher enters the aneurysm. And you can see uh, once the micro catheter and the micro wire are into the position, the wire is removed and uh, the framing of the aneurysm is started. So this is how you frame the coil, the primary loop and the secondary loop. This helps, and this is a point of detachment. With the electrolytic or mechanical detachment, the uh, coil is uh, deployed. Flow diverters. Flow diverters specifically came for giant aneurysm with preservation of the parent artery. And because thrombosis and obliteration of the aneurysm, uh, with the wide neck aneurysm greater than 10 millimeter and also in fusive uh, form aneurysm. Uh, these are flexible and low porosity stent design, uh, which helps to reconstruct the parent artery without with formation of the endothelium over it. So pipeline by Medtronic, Fred uh, by Microvention Teremo and surpass by streamline, uh, surpass streamline by Striker are the most commonly used. Uh, deployment requires precision and the risk of thromboembolic complications are there. The patients uh, required to be placed on dual antiplatelet therapy uh, for at least a period of minimum uh, one year. Uh, generally, what uh, the protocol is around uh, uh, dual antiplatelets for a period of six months following which one is stopped and one is continued. So this is how a uh, uh, flow diverter looks like. So you can see multiple uh, uh, um, companies have uh, produced, uh, the silk is produced by uh, uh, BALT and this is the anchoring zone. Uh, through which you anchor it to the vessel and uh, most of the uh, part, uh, the middle part is being tried to place at the uh, neck of the aneurysm. So this is another video which depicts uh, or shows how an uh, flow diverter is deployed. And this is of the silk. So you can see uh, the uh, operator has uh, deployed, has started uh, opening up the, uh, the flow diverter. And uh, after opening it for a little bit time, then he will come to the most appropriate landing zone. So once he comes to the uh, landing zone, uh, he'll pull it back and then 
further he will try to release the tension so once the tension is released you can see the uh, flow diopter being uh, uh, bulkier again and then he will start pushing there is a thing called as uh, pushing and pulling so you pull, uh, unsheath the uh, flow diopter so this is where they want to land this is the distal landing zone and uh, once uh, they continue pushing the stent and in giant aneurysms generally you put a microcatheter and you uh, uh, still do a uh, coiling because of delayed uh, reports of delayed rupture of the aneurysm so web device this is a recent development uh, it was uh, called as wo uh, woven endobridge device uh, by microvention and it is a flow disruptor device it provides flow di disruption at the neck of the aneurysm and this causing thrombosis it is made up of nitinol it is it can be used in a ruptured and uh, unruptured aneurysm the advantage of uh, web device is that it is very easy to deploy and uh, with minimal radiation the procedure just can be finished off within 15 to 20 minutes uh, intracellular embolization minimize the need for dual antiplatelets uh, the range of the sizes is from 3.2 to 11.9 mm and they require a special microcatheter the via 17 and via 33 which is uh, prepared by the same company so this is a web device you can see it's a single layer and uh, this is a web SS, sls single layer spherical the radial force uh, which presses around the uh, wall of the aneurysm holds the uh, web device in position and uh, this is a small video which uh, depicts how an, an uh, web device is deployed so uh, you can see uh, this is a um, um, uh, anatomy of the web device and there are two tantalum markers uh, so this is how most important thing in web, uh, 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 the surgery of web device is that uh, measuring the an uh, aneurysm very accurately and this is how you deploy them and uh, deployment is pretty uh, easy but uh, you need to see whether the parent artery and the branching arteries are uh, uh, not being compressed or not being uh, uh, engulfed within the uh, uh, mesh of the web device and uh, with time uh, the endothelium forms over over the uh, device so coming to uh, contrast uh, non ionic contrasts are generally used for cerebral angiography uh, the most uh, contrast uh, agents uh, with uh, 180 to 200 mg of iodine provide good vessel opacification in this modern machine the most common formula is weight into uh, uh, 5 kg uh, upon serum creatinine is the most tolerable volume uh the anticoagulation so during all neuro intervention procedures uh patient needs uh, to be uh, on uh, heparin so that there is no embolic events during the procedure so initial a bolus dose of 60 to 80 units per kg followed by 20 to 40 kg units per kg every hour can be given we need the act between 250 to 300 and uh, make sure uh, all the catheters and sheets are continuously flushed with heparin saline uh so you can uh, put 1000 to 2000 units in 1 liter of saline uh, um, and uh, the patients with heparin induced thrombocytopenia they can be put on delivered in it's a reversible direct thrombin inhibitors and a short half life of 30 minutes the uh, dosage are around 0.1 mg per kg per liter for normal saline solution uh, the bolus of 0.75 mg per kg can also be administered and post procedure always uh, uh, try to reversing the effect of heparin Uh, with the protamine with a dose of 10 mg for 1000 units uh, the com complications uh, in uh, endovascular uh, procedures the most important and the uh, one which can be easily uh, avoided are thrombotic and thromboembolic uh, intracranial hemorrhages can occur subarachnoid hemorrhage arterial dissections arterial side excess site complications vasospasm and the device failure Uh, there is a risk uh, uh, increases when there is additional use of device such as balloon and stents similarly uh, for flow diverters they have a unique risk of intracranial uh, parenchymal hemorrhage and delayed aneurysm rupture uh, mechanical thrombectomy procedures um, complications uh, they range from recanalization failure to reperfusion hemorrhage and embolization of a previously unaffected territory so one should always remember the risk associated with radiation exposure uh while dealing uh, with a susceptible population such as children uh, some of the tips uh, in neurointervention are 
uh, study a detailed angio architecture of AVM and dural AV fistulas. It's very, very important to uh, understand the exact feeders. And uh, for that, you need to do a selective or a super selective uh, um, uh, um, DSAs, and then you can treat them successfully. Uh, aneurysms always study the detailed shape, the surrounding branches, relation of the aneurysm to the parent and the branching vessel, and always choose a wo appropriate working angle. Uh, make use of the 3D rotational angiography and exact measurements of the parent vessel and aneurysm. Uh, cone beam CT, it's a, a recent development which uh, can be done in the angio suit itself and it uses less contrast and shows a real-time imaging and you, it helps you to visualize the position of all the flow diameters where you have used a stand and how uh, uh, the embolization of the aneurysm has occurred. Uh, uh, choosing the appropriate device and shaping them pro appropriately is very, very important. Uh, always do a hands-on practice on demo models and uh, try understanding your cath lab machine. Uh, a neurosurgical resident or a young uh, neurosurgeon who is uh, keen to work in uh, endovascular should know each and every branching arrangement from the anterior to posterior circulation, should understand the dangerous anastomosis and the aortic arch in the initial phases, and uh, understand the superficial and the deep venous system. So this is a silicon uh, model through which you can uh, get a hands-on uh, feel and uh, uh, try keeping on about the devices, about the guiding catheters. Uh, this is a, uh, a roadmap. Roadmap is very important to negotiate any kind of microcatheters. And uh, this is a three-dimensional roadmap, a recent development through which uh, you can navigate and also see whether you are uh, exactly within the uh, vasculature uh, which, uh, which you want to uh, uh, hook. Uh, this is uh, the uh, translucent uh, 3D uh, angiography. You can see how approximation of the flow diameter uh, has been uh, uh, done. And uh, these are some of the images, uh, similarly a translucent uh, and post embolization of the aneurysm. So uh, coming to the end of the last slides, uh, mechanical thrombectomy, it's one of the revolution in neuro intervention. So currently uh, recommended uh, is up to six hours, but uh, still if there is a mismatch between DW and flare, uh, you can proceed and if the uh, penumbra um, is, uh, if the core is uh, salvageable, you can proceed with mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, there are two uh, options, two treatment strategies can be uh, used. One is an aspiration thrombectomy called as a direct first pass aspiration thrombectomy or a stent retriever, retriever uh, based thrombectomy. When you combine both the techniques, it's called as solumbra technique. Various stents and uh, retrievers are well as aspiration catheters are available for clinical use. Um, and uh, so right now we are into the third generation of uh, stent retrievers. This is a preset, this is Embotrap and Phenox uh, CRC. And uh, this is how you uh, deploy the stent retriever. You try to uh, engulf it with the, you try to engulf the uh, uh, clot and uh, pull it out through the aspiration catheter. The most commonly used is solitaire. And uh, this is how you uh, inflate a balloon uh, guiding catheter. You take a micro. Uh, you take an aspiration catheter. Uh, you within that you put a micro catheter. You uh, place the stent retriever distal to the thrombus. Uh, it is important uh, that it is placed distal so that the engulfment of the thrombus is uh, good and the outcome is good. Uh, the vascular closure devices based upon the collagen patch uh, uh, or uh, suture based uh, vascular devices. So. This is a small video of how to close your um, uh, procedure and uh, uh, seal the uh, arteriotomy which uh, uh, we had created for all the procedures. So once uh, the proglide uh, system is inside the uh, femoral uh, artery, you can see uh, you just have to um, uh, click down the uh, button and the suture material starts coming out. So once the suture material starts coming out, you can the knot is already inside. Uh, the knot is already inside the uh, 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 device, and it's loaded onto the uh, outer side of the uh, uh, arteriotomy. So you can see the knot being pushed. So you take this device; it's a knot pusher, and you push the knot and close the device, and close the arteriotomy side. So this is another uh, uh, radial compression device for uh, transradial procedures. And uh, that's it. Thank you.
Thank you, Prof. Dr. Samir. The title of your talk is about introduction to neurovascular intervention, but I think it is a very extensive uh, introduction and uh, covering from the puncturing side to even to closure devices. So I would like to open this uh, first session of question and answer. Uh, maybe Professor Anatovic and uh, or Professor Yopokato can would like to ask some questions. Yes. So the, the dragon, can you ask the, the question to him? Uh, yeah, uh, I have one question. Um, uh, that's about um, endovascular stroke treatment. You say that um, treatment is possible uh, 40, uh, 24, uh, one day after onset of symptoms. Uh, what is the result about late stroke therapy? Yes. So previously it was that very strict that uh, within six hours, if the patient uh, has uh, the angiosuit and you have done a uh, uh, mechanical thrombectomy, the results were good. But currently, if there is a mismatch uh, upon, in DWI and flare and uh, the stroke has not developed on the CT scan, you can still proceed. There won't be immediate uh, result, but the results over a period of one year are very promising. Okay. So, are there any uh, questions? Uh, Thomas, I think there is a question uh, in the chat box. Yeah. Uh, in the chat so... box, uh, question from uh, Nadim Akhtar. Uh, thank you for the good presentation. What is the incidence of mortality and morbidity in your toilet techniques of aneurysms? So, so that if on table aneurysm rupture occurs, and uh, if you don't have any uh, uh, balloon which can occlude the aneurysm, so what being important as a neurosurgeon is, I can occlude the aneurysm with a balloon which acts as a temporary mini clip. And I can go and uh, go in and uh, proceed with the microsurgical clipping. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, I learned that in India, uh, usually you use uh, uh, stamping in uh, ruptured cases, which is some parts of the, uh, the world, uh, it is uh, contraindicated for ruptured cases. So uh, what is your opinion about that? Uh, can you please repeat the question? Uh, there's a little bit of commotion and I'm not able to oh, okay. hear your question. So I learned in India, you can use a stenting procedure in ruptured cases. So uh, I learned in other parts of uh, the world that uh, stenting is contraindicated in ruptured cases. So what is your opinion or your experience about that? Yes, yes. Uh, I personally feel that uh, whether uh, it's a ruptured or an uh, unruptured aneurysm, uh, many people in India, uh, they use uh, or they deploy flow diverters, uh, the stent which uh, they use for uh, either coiling and uh, for uh, uh, treatment of aneurysm. But uh, till date, I have not seen any uh, mortality or morbid uh, mortality uh, related to the use of flow diverters even in rupture aneurysm. So uh, I think we can utilize uh, uh, these flow diverters in case of rupture aneurysm. And uh, since I mean, that's what I have uh, uh, my little experience of and, uh, and, uh, uh, using a flow diverter in one of my patients, uh, uh, which was a ruptured aneurysm, and uh, she's still uh, doing good. Yes, Thomas, about this uh, this question. Um, also, in my country, uh, sometimes uh, uh, stents are used in ruptured aneurysms. Uh, I, uh, in my opinion, uh, if it is possible to avoid, it's better avoid uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, in in rupture cases, uh, you might need to place an EVD, for example, and uh, you know with the anti antiplatelet uh, uh, therapy, uh, which uh, must be performed. Uh, that can be. Uh, risky that can increase risks of bleeding so 
I, I have the feeling that, okay, we don't have probably enough uh, uh, follow-up and enough numbers uh, to, to make a final statement about this uh, uh, procedure in these cases, but uh, if possible, in my mind, it's better to avoid and prefer surgery. Uh, if, uh, if the um, intervention in neuroradiology uh, can provide a simple procedure with coiling, uh, uh, that's uh, great. Uh, if it is more complex uh, with stents uh, or flow diverters, uh, besides uh, very selected cases, of course, uh, I think uh, it should be carefully considered. My opinion, at least. I don't know if uh, yes. other uh, colleagues here have experience about that or uh, other. Yeah, I think also like that, um, if there is a good instrument that is like a stand contraindicated in ruptured cases and we still use them. And if there is complication occur, uh, then there's, the, the product could be what it's called uh, under, could be banned or under, under, uh, under watch for the government. So it could be a problem with the, the, the instruments also, I think. Also the same idea. So if we can, if we can avoid that, uh, I think we should avoid. I think uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Samir made a very uh, thoughtful uh, presentation, very complete. Actually, uh, you you gave us uh, a clear idea of how much complex uh, this field is. Uh, it's a very lively uh, area uh, with many devices uh, coming up uh, almost every <laughs> couple of days, which is at the same time uh, uh, exciting uh, and also problematic. I would like to, uh, to have your opinion about that. I mean, of course, uh, uh, intervention and neuroradiology uh, has a uh, faster learning curve compared to microsurgery. Uh, but the fact that we always uh, have new devices poses a problem. Um, uh, we have more resources, of course, but also we uh, probably uh, are not able to uh, get enough patients uh, with uh, enough long follow-up to assess whether a device uh, is uh, convenient for the patient or not. Uh, so I would like a comment uh, from you and other other colleagues about this. I, I uh, thank you for the question. And I feel that uh, until uh, the explicity of the device has been established in multiple countries and multiple parts of the world, uh, it should uh, uh, be uh, uh, tested and uh, noted by the uh, time and period and in almost all parts of the world, then uh, you can, uh, I feel that, uh, uh, say that yes, this device is good. And uh, you need a little bit of time, but the companies which are there in this uh, field, they are in much hurry of uh, uh, releasing out newer and newer uh, technologies. And uh, the neuro interventionists uh, and uh, even the endovascular surgeons, they are keen uh, in using this uh, thing. So I think there should be a uh, consensual body which uh, regulates all these things. Thank you. Mm, are there any yeah. more questions from the audience? Uh, uh, there is uh, another question from Dr. Nadim. Roughly, what is the cost of coiling and clipping in India? Uh, I would like to answer that. Uh, it's not about the cost. It's about the time duration spent by the patient in the hospital. If you do a clipping and it ruptures, the patient is going to stay for a period, say, more than 10, 15, 20 days. It's going to cost same as that uh, much as of the endovascular procedure. Rather, you do a successful endovascular procedure and send the patient home on the fifth or seventh day, the bill is going to be the same. So I don't think so that uh, price should drive the uh, uh, treatment part. Yeah, I also agree about that. So because... Uh, if uh, instrument wise, uh, a new instrument should will always be more expensive than the old instrument. So uh, a clip is always more 
uh, is cheaper than uh, in, uh, uh, coils. Uh, so we have to measure or we have to count the total cost and we have to uh, uh, differentiate between cases because complication case should be more expensive than a single case. I think that, yeah, yeah, yes. I agree with that. So, uh, uh, another, uh, is there another questions? And as I think we should, uh, if, if there is no other question, I think we should close this uh, session. Maybe Professor Kato can uh, uh, give your 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 um, your advice or your experience for uh, the young neurosurgeons how to how to develop this uh, field. Thank you very much, and Thomas. So you look very nice, <laughs> and, and nice T-shirts. I think that is a new one. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, the, the the younger generation should learn both. Of course, microsurgery and also endovascular. It's a time of the endovascular treatment uh, because uh, maybe the three coiling uh, almost equal the time of the one clipping. And also the uh, the viewpoint was the minimally invasive, I think, for the patient. Uh, I think uh, endovascular is much uh, efficient for the patient, I think. And also, uh, just I want to ask uh, Samil about uh, the viewer, uh, uh, your suggestion or what is the ideal the treatment for the, uh, the, the such as a, the aneurysm maybe you said uh, the web because it's uh, some some institutes they do not use uh, anticoagulant for web uh, system so I, I think it's much uh, yes. good for the patient I think yes that is the advantage of web that uh, it causes an intracellular uh, placement so we deploy it intracellularly and no uh, part of that uh, device is into the parent vessel so there is no need of any uh, anticoagulation uh, during this web device and the risk of aneurysm rupture is very very less as per uh, say uh, uh, currently there is no evidence uh, that aneurysm has ruptured because of the web device. It can get ruptured because of the catheter, but it has not been ruptured because of the web device. It's because it's very soft and flexible. It adapts to the uh, structure of the aneurysm. Thank you very much. So I, I think that for the younger generation, you should learn the both side uh, because it's. Uh, I think uh, uh, the radio surgery and endovascular or endoscope. Uh, will take over the uh, I think microsurgery in the in the very near future. I think. Thank you very much for a nice uh, the webinar today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Professor. Uh, I think we have time for another uh, short question from uh, Dr. Habibulo uh, about the incidence of aneurysm formation within the side puncture. How to avoid it? Maybe uh, not aneurysm, but pseudo aneurysm. I think. Can uh, Dr. Samir? Uh, your so, I feel uh, uh, that uh, the uh, aneurysm develops only if your puncturing technique is at fault or you have not used the atrotomy site properly. If you do a single wall puncture, I have uh, till now never ever experienced any uh, uh, pseudoaneurysm uh, uh, found at that place at the atrotom uh, at the puncture site. And uh, with the newer vascular closure device, I feel uh, the uh, incidence of pseudonism has decreased to much more extent. It's almost nil. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Samir. And thank you for the audience, for the attention. And I would like to close this session. And I uh, 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 give back or return the session to my moderate the moderator professor alberti please thank you thank you thank you uh, thomas uh, thank you uh, samir for the next presentation uh, so i think uh, we had a great day today with two wonderful talks uh, and uh, very active discussion uh, thank you to our speakers thank you professor Cato, uh, for uh, your support
Uh, thank you, Thomas, uh, for uh, helping me in moderating the session. And thank uh, to all uh, the audience uh, for uh, a very active uh, discussion. I would like to remind you uh, about our next uh, uh, webinar, which will be in November, November 6th. So uh, uh, remember to, to join our webinar also next month. Thank you very much. <laughs>